interesting today. I had someone contact me by the name of Hutchinson that is trying to get a hold of my daddy and uh, on YouTube. And uh, it, it turns out, you know, the first thing you think is, oh, this is a bill collector. Um, and he, um, uh, it's kind of interesting. I'm like, yeah, you know, my dad's name is very common. And there's lots of them. As a matter of fact, in the town that he had um, uh, his corporate in Rendon Array, California, when I was a kid, I looked up in the phone book, and uh, there was miles of people with his name. And I'm like, man. So, um, which makes it interesting, because if it weren't for my grandfather, I wouldn't have found my dad because my mom told us he was dead. And uh, if I'd even tried to look him up, there'd have been millions of them. And I'd probably never found him. It probably took half my lifetime to find him. But anyway, so um, my father, his mother is Tessie James Miller. And she married a guy named Paul Miller. And my dad told me he, he was Paul James Miller III. So I assume that her daddy was Paul James Miller. Or or her husband's daddy was Paul James Miller. And then her husband's name was Paul James Miller. And then my dad's name is Paul James Miller. So um, I don't know. Uh, the one who would know is my grandmother. <laughs> um, but she's gone. Um and it's been a while. She did some interesting things. She uh, was a real famous genealogist um, from, you know, Oklahoma all the way to California and Missouri, too. Um, and um, my dad was born in Missouri, um, but raised in Oklahoma. And my grandmother did this genealogy thing. And you have to think, you know, back then... You know, they didn't have computerization and all this modern technology. She would sit down and write letters to people. To people in government offices, city offices, to, um, uh, um, what do they call it, uh, census people. And they would write that to her. And a lot of them got so friendly, they would, you know, be like talking all their personal life to like, oh, my daughter had her baby and da, 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 and so-and-so got married to so-and-so. And all these were like notes. You know, my grandmother kept huge logs. Um, and it, you could name a last name and she could tell you all about it. Uh, amazing. Um, I don't know if it was just, she was just a hobbyist. Um, or somebody else taught her. I don't really know. Um, you know, she was ancient when I knew her. I, I, I probably knew her when I was young, when my parents were married. But I really didn't know her until I went to go live with my daddy. And um, um, she was actually one of the most hated people in my lifetime. I did not like that woman. Um, she was very Southern. Um, and she absolutely despised black people and she would make sure that you understood it and she would say it out loud. I don't know why, but you know, she was typically Southern. Um, I don't know if she was born in Oklahoma or what. My, my dad was born in Missouri. He called it Missouri. Um, but uh, her husband was into oil. And that's like how she apparently got her money. I guess she had a ton of money. I don't know. Um, but uh, um, she was definitely an interesting person. Um, I, you know, kind of saved her life in the end. I took somebody I hated more than anything in the world and went and helped them and overstepped the boundaries of my father because... He was going to put her in a nursing home. I said, don't do that. That's how they killed my grandfather um, when they took everything away from him. And I'm like, you know, I'll take her. 
And I had a very nice house at that time out in the Hawthorne Lennox area. Um, uh, Hawthorne Lennox, Inglewood, somewhere there. And I had a very, very nice house by Northrop Engineering. And um, I had plenty of room. And uh, I told him, I'll take her. And then he offered me, I think my rent was like 600 a month. And I think he offered me like 400 a month to take care of her. I don't even remember if he ever paid me. Um, my dad sometimes talked and didn't follow through at times. I mean, he meant well. It's just, you kind of had to remind him. He was very business. He had lots going on. And, you know, I, I don't know how he kept track of everything anyway. Because he was just an incredibly busy person. I think that guy was still puzzling stuff in his sleep. But um, I kept her for, I don't know, two or three months. And um, things went bad. Um, and I came home one day and like I had all these cops and sheriffs in the yard. And and, and it was it was messy. I, I thought I was going to go to jail. Um, because I was trying to help my dad's mother. <clears throat> he worked, he didn't have time to babysit her. And I, I, you know, worked a great job, made great money, and, you know, <laughs> I could be around for her and all that. And, and actually, I learned so much from her. Um, we got to be really, really good friends um, when she lived with me. Uh, everything was a story. She always had a wonderful story to tell. One of the bigger problems of her staying with me was... This woman, Pearl McCullough, which, you know, I kind of understood that that was her sister, but I didn't know if that was really true. This woman was crazier than, than what they call a hill of beans. And they would call each other all the time and argue. I mean, just get full blast. And I'm like, this older lady's going to have a stroke right here in my kitchen. You know, over all this excitement and, you know, why not eliminate the negativity in life, right? But no, this was a common thing between those two. They always went back and forth and it ended up being a massive screaming battle. And and it was like, man, just hang up the phone, hang up the phone. Um, uh, now, I never saw Pearl McCullough that I know of. <laughs> but... She lived in, in Oklahoma. I think she actually lived in Pryor. And um, I'm not sure, though. But uh, I was in California at the time when I had my grandmother living with me. Um, and then my dad had to put her in a home. And that was kind of a messy deal. And then I guess she passed away later. And But what was interesting was all of her genealogy files and the way I know about these letters and things... Um, were up in my Aunt Roseanne Cash's garage at the lake house in Salina. Boxes of it. Just boxes. I'm like, how did you get all this? From Grandma. And she's like, well, I just have it all. And I'm like, well, you know. And my grandmother used to go back and forth every year from California to Oklahoma. And, um, you know, she would come out to see my dad and us kids and and we couldn't wait to get her back on the plane and ship her back out. We didn't like her. And the bad part was my dad used to plant her on us. Because he was really never around. He was always working. So we had to put up with it. And it was just, ah. Uh. Now, my, my, I don't know. My baby sister might talk different. But I couldn't stand that woman. I couldn't stand that woman. You know, my family is super proper. My mom and dad. And, you know, you're to be very proper and nice. And light and you know we were not hoodlums from hell and all that we were raised very decent my dad's captain in the navy um my mother was a stewardess for um, american airlines amongst other things um yeah so you know we had to put up with her and never got to really tell her what we thought um and uh she was very old country um, she's an Okie. That's what they call it, an Okie. Um, and she went back and forth. So Roseanne had all this stuff. And I, when I went back to Oklahoma in 1986, I believe it was May of 1986 with my daughter, 
um, we left California to see if the grass was greener. We had a great offer from Roseanne, which I wasn't ex real excited about. Matter of fact, I, I, I packed for four weeks and I cried almost every day before I left because I didn't know what I was walking into. And everybody I asked in California, like, so what's Oklahoma like? And they're like, well, it's like sugar beets and tumbleweed. And I was like, gross. And, uh, Hey, Jim, there he is, that magic man of the hour. And so, um, uh, she, um, uh, uh, she, she had, uh, all these files of these, these people and stuff, and I was reading them. Uh, you know, I was, she wanted to go, wanted me to go through a bunch of stuff in the garage. And, I mean, it was enough for her to park her Lincoln in there. She always had a brand new Lincoln. And um, back then they were like $30,000. That was a lot of money. And uh, uh, so, you know, she did have a garage and she had a few things around. But there was all these boxes. And, I, you know, I started going through a lot of the boxes trying to help organize. And, you know, the rats would get up in there because it was over the lake in Salina. And there was, you know, it was a real country. So I would help her by putting out rat poisons and that because she would tell me, you know, the rats get in here. And and so I was going through these boxes and there was all these really old letters. And and they're signed by my grandmother, Tessie James Miller. And she had real kind of fancy curly Q writing. And um, I don't know how much education she actually had. I imagine probably not much. Um, back in those days, a lot of the Southerners married incredibly young. I mean, really young. Um, to, not to the standards we have today where it's like, if you're under 18, that's like the cardinal sin. But it, they, they, it was just something you did. It was like, if you became 16 and you weren't married, you were like an old maid in life. No one wanted you. You know, you were kind of used up. You were too old, you know. They all married incredibly young. And a lot of them had older husbands. Um, And that was just kind of, a, I guess, a thing of the South. I know a guy today that works for me, and he's in his 80s. And he says, you know, he's with the same lady he's been with all his life. And uh, she is... Um, uh, he married her when she was like, I think he said like 14 or 15. And I'm like, oh. <laughs> but, you know, I, he may be Southern. I don't know. I've never asked too much. But it's like, you know, I know because of his age that that's a very common thing back in the day. Um, so, uh, you know, I don't know. I don't know when Tessie was exactly married. I'm sure if I researched it, I don't know. And this Hutchinson guy, I think he knows. But um, as a matter of fact, this ring was from my daddy. No one else wanted it. And the story is it was Tessie's ring. I'm not sure. It, it, we call it the, the, ball, the, the ring of fire. Um, it had a very expensive um, opal in it. It had the, the, what do you call it, fire opal. I still have the opal. I don't like opals. I hate them. They're really soft. They break. They're just horrible things. And I wanted to make take that piece and make it a brooch for my baby sister. My baby sister's not real fancy like that. So I don't know if she would be impressed and I was going to put, you know, his family name on there and stuff. But, um... You know, I've had people ask me twice to sell it. And I'm like, no. Uh, and this was my pride and joy. My father's, you know, looked at this ring all the time. Um, and he would go crazy looking for it. And my baby sister took it away and hid it at her house, which was probably not a good thing. But, um, but yeah, and so this ring is ancient old. Ancient. Um, and actually, I'm proud to wear it. Um, and, and it kind of represents you know how things can change in life here's a woman i couldn't stand her guts when i was a kid because she wasn't right she wasn't you know like you're supposed to be 
open to everybody no matter what color they are and all that she was just typically southern she hated blacks and she called them the n-word all day long and she would do it in public and it was just not cool and i was just not into all that stuff and my mother used to talk about how my dad was nothing but a stupid okey and and a hillbilly and all that stuff and my dad's not a hillbilly but you know, yeah, I guess, well, he's not even really an Okie. He was born in Missouri, but raised in Oklahoma, but he wasn't there long. He went off into the Navy, and he was a kid, and maybe he didn't get away from his mom, but she was kind of interesting. But she was really intelligent, though. Um, you know, she could tell you stories for days. I used to take buses and buses from Marina Del Rey all the way to downtown L.A. to go see my grandmother, Tessie James Miller, because nobody else would. And, and, you know, I, I had actually moved out of the house um, and still went to go see her. And I would take her in whatever latest car I had and take her down to the big cafeteria in downtown L.A. that she wanted to go to. We used to walk so she would had trouble walking. And she was really elderly. And she was kind of portly. Um, and she had that real southern drawl, like something out of a movie. And her hair always had to be done. She always wore a dress. She wore funny little stockings that kind of went up over her knee. Uh, that was a thing, you know. She was, And she always dressed real proper. She had miles of jewelry. I always thought it was fake. My baby sister swears to this day every bit of it was real. I mean, she wore like 30 gold bracelets on one arm and, you know, like 20 on the other with a watch and... I, and she wore necklaces and all kinds of rings. And I always thought that stuff was fake. But my baby sister swears to this day that all that was real. And apparently a lot of it was stolen in the, in the nursing homes she ended up in. Um, which is shame. Because the word is that they were an oil family. And so I'm sure the guy was buying her jewelry all day long. But, and, you know, today this stuff's just worth a mint. Um... I get comments on the Ring of Fire ring a lot, um, especially when I still had the opal in it, um, which I bought another stone for it. I just haven't been to my jeweler to have him set the stone that needs to go into it. But, um, um, and, and I'm like, well, it's my daddy's ring, but it's my grandmother's. It was his mother's ring. And I, I don't know. The more I look at it, I really swear that it's Roseanne's ring. Roseanne used to wear a lot of big jewelry. My daddy's sister, Roseanne Cash. And um, I and the appraisal on the ring was done in 1986, which was the same month that I flew in from California. And not four weeks later, did Roseanne want to take me and my baby down to Nola because she had a condo there that she owned. And um, uh, right in the quarter. And um, uh, it overlooked the wax museum, and there was a bar on the corner that operated like 24 hours a day. And it, it was really sad because I couldn't go to those things. So I'd sit on the, on the balcony and watch the people and stuff. And you'd hear them at night partying their eyeballs out and carrying on. And it was like, man, this is so dull. And I've got a baby with me, you know. Um, but my, my daughter, I took her to the wax museum, which was super fun. Um, she was in a baby stroller, um, so, you know, um, so she was, we left in May, she was born in April, and so, um, she was very, very little, um, but back to those letters, the boxes and boxes of letters that, I don't know how Roseanne ended up with them, maybe because, you know, my grandmother might have lived in Prior Creek or something, um, and, and so she had all these boxes, and I don't know. She just, she called her mother. Mother. I don't think Roseanne was that close to Tessie. Um, I can't imagine why. Um, it, it just didn't seem like there's a lot of love there. But, I mean, Roseanne was kind of a weird person. She was kind of the more evil of my daddy. Um, my daddy's quite stern, Navy man, all that kind of stuff. Um, no bull crap. He wasn't somebody that would you know duke you out or anything like that he didn't own guns and and he just you know talked his way through life and he didn't have like massive problems with people um and uh, 
like, I guess he was just the lucky one. He put on a very good presentation in public with people at all times. Um, intriguing. And Roseanne was kind of like the bold truth. And he and Roseanne looked a lot alike. And they all, well, they all looked alike. My dad had that nose. Roseanne had that nose, his sister. And Tessie had that nose. And like me, I got my mom's nose, and my baby sister has this little piggy nose. She gets mad when I say that. Um, but she does. She has this funny little piggy nose. And um, But that nose. And it, what was really funny is when I went to Oklahoma to live and help Roseanne with the apartment buildings and do abstracting and all that crap, um, I had a wonderful opportunity of meeting my great-great-great-uncle Rufus James. This guy was a character, um, and he lived, like, forever. I think he went to, like, 110 or 120. I don't know what. He went, like, a really long time. Um, and Roseanne was kind of, like, in charge of him or something. Um, and she had put him in a home, in a nursing home. Um, he had cancer of the face, and they took his, like, nose off. And, you know, I was kind of scared for my baby girl because I thought it would freak her out and be like the Halloween act. Because, you know, we did have to go up and see him after he lost his nose. Um, and it was kind of scary looking. Um, and my daughter just was happy and j giggling with him. And just, I mean, like, it didn't even affect her. I guess babies are just different. Um, so, um, I used to have a blast going up to see him. And it was really bad because... I went up there a lot. I had, I had a car and I used to drive up there a lot because I love older people. You learn so much from older people. And he was a very interesting person. And I was kind of intrigued by my dad's side of the family who I really never knew. Um, and these Southern people were just kind of really different people. Um, I'm not Southern. My daddy was. So don't even go there. I'm about as Southern as a French fry. I am not Southern. My mother Danish, I'm European, my dad is Southern, I'm not Southern, that's just it. Don't even mistake me for a Southerner because I'm not. Now, I've lived in the South for, you know, several years, and because I hated California, it really, I went back a few times and it just didn't impress me, um, and um, it's just too much of a struggle in California. The South, it's, the people are different. You'll have people that you'll make friends with that are like family to you southern people are very interesting they're very different they're very warm um and it's just kind of a different thing altogether it's kind of like um i guess you had to be there term i guess you had to be there i i had so, i've had some wonderful friends in the south absolutely wonderful friends and i've had some pretty crappy ones too that fooled me um, especially in Oklahoma. Oh, I got burned for a truckload of money in Oklahoma. Um, but, um, yeah, so, um, I found it very interesting because my grandmother, I don't know if she learned that, that it stuff with the genealogy or did any education for it. I think it might've just been a hobby thing because she was a wife of a rich guy in the oil biz or, or what. Now I do know that my daddy's father died before my daddy was born. Okay. That means Tessie's husband died before my daddy was born. So uh, my dad never knew his dad. Um, I never knew him. Um, and so, but um, um, this man that's on the vlog now, Mr. Hutchinson, he says that Rufus James was the brother to my grandmother, Tessie James, who was my daddy's mom. But that Rufus, he was a character. Let me go back to that. So I used to go out there, drive out there all the time. I can't remember. He was like way out in Muskogee or something. And I used to go visit him at the nursing home Roseanne had put him in. Now, this was so pitiful because this little dude, and he had that, that Miller nose, that James Miller nose, um, too. And, and, uh, 
Now, this guy, I guess, is supposed to be my, my grandma's brother. And you wouldn't imagine it because they those two are nothing alike in any way. This guy was, like, you know, five foot two, three, maybe. Um, he wasn't fat. He wasn't too skinny. Um, he's, you know, typically southern, very polite, very business. Let me tell you how this guy made his money, okay? Well, what am I talking about? Well, maybe you need to start at the beginning of the vlog, and maybe you'll know. Um, so, anyway, um, he he didn't even belong in a nursing home. It was so sad. Um, when, we, when we go out and visit him, they would sometimes give him a wheelchair, and he would, like, push it around. And then, you know, the, the nurses were intrigued. Like, he would, he would tell them, bring my girl a soda pop. And, and we drink, you know, Cokes, short dog Cokes out of the little green bottle. I just love those nickel Cokes. And um, uh, we just talk and talk and talk. And he would push that wheelchair around when he went to go to different place in the nursing home and all that. And it was actually a pretty good nursing home. It wasn't like some I've been to that are just really scary and foul. It was just like a little hospital type thing, you know. And um, he would tell them. She's my girl. She's my girl. And I'm like, oh my gosh. You know? And um, it was kind of embarrassing. But he was so proud when I would come to see him. My girl's here. My girl's here. And I would spend hours. I mean, until they actually had to take him away to put him down night <laughs> um, to visit with him. And, you know, I asked him. It was really funny. You know, I asked him. I said, well, Uncle Rufus, I said, what was your first car? And he says, it was a, a black wagon. I said, a black wagon? I said, I said, I mean, like a station wagon? And he's like, no. He said, had me a wagon. And 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 I said, like, like a wagon, like with wagon wheels, like, you know, and gun smoke to show or something. He's like, yeah. And I said, that was your first car? He said, yeah. And I said, well, um... So, did you go to college? Or, you know, what did you do for business and all that? And Uncle Rufus says, well, he says, I do land. He said, I do land. And, 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 and I'm like, what? Now, here's the story with Uncle Rufus. This guy never worked a day in his life. But he always carried a briefcase. He always carried a briefcase with documents in it. And those documents were land. He did land. That's how he made all his money. And he was like a millionaire. I don't know how many times over. Um, I know my, my Aunt Roseanne and my daddy benefited a lot from that. Because he was trying to find every relative he could to give money away to. He never gave me any money. But, you know, I, I adored him. He was great fun to go visit. Um, and uh, he just didn't seem like he should be, you know, in a nursing home. He didn't seem senile in any way. Um, he was pushing his own wheelchair around. Uh, he just seemed really stable. I had the honor of having his beautiful dining room suit in my apartment uh, when I ran the apartment complex for Roseanne in Pryor Creek, Oklahoma. And it was just a beautiful thing. I thought, oh, my baby's going to destroy this thing. But no, we... We kept it and kept it nice and returned it to Roseanne in perfect shape, oddly enough. It was that, that really dark wood, you know, kind of looks black, you know, when they lacquer it and everything. And it's, it was just pristine. Um, but this is what this guy did. He never worked a day in his life. All he did was roll property. It's interesting how these people made their money years ago. Um, I, it's just amazing, you know. Uh, and so he was incredibly smart. Great businessman. Don't believe he is like Jesse's brother in any way because he was so different from her. He was a more positive, happy, business type guy, respectable guy, uh, loving person. Um, I guess you would call typically Southern. Um, uh, he was neat. You know, if you had the chance to meet him, it was worth every second that you spent. He was incredible. But all those people like that, you know, that whole family, 
they all had some kind of story, you know. Um, but back to Tessie, she was pretty iconic. She was famous for genealogy and doll collecting and like around the world. Um, she stayed in a place that she paid all year round every year. And she would come out from Oklahoma for one or two months and then go back. But she paid for that place and kept it. This little tiny room in a big giant building in downtown L.A. Ugh, um, called the Biola Hotel. And I think later they changed it to the Rainbow Hotel. It's right next to the L.A. County Library. Which my grandmother loved because she could go over there and research stuff. Uh, like names, because people would ask her, you know, can you research my family tree? And she's like, oh, yeah. So it was really neat because she didn't have to write a lot of those letters anymore. And computerization wasn't even there yet for home use. Um, it was done for banks and things like that. It wasn't for home use at that time. And so she could, you know, go to the library uh, and, and uh, go research stuff. And when you went in that library, it was right there next to that hotel. It's like in a dead end street, L.A. County Public Library. And it's probably still there. Um, and when you walked in the door to the left, up the walls were big, giant newspaper articles in frames of my grandmother, Tessie James Miller. And they were the doll collections. They were interviews with her about genealogy and, you know, the different families that she researched and she would tell the wonderful histories of that. And then, you know, at one point in time when I went up there to see her, I used to go a lot um, and I didn't even like her, but she was like kind of the only grandma I had. Um, my grandmother on my mother's side, you know, it passed away before I was born. Um, she had passed away when my mother was very, very young. That was 17 children in her family. Um, and uh so you know i had my grandma and and my my mom's daddy my grandfather he was out in artesia um but uh th they were definitely two different kinds of folks um and so tessie was very very interesting um and she could talk god she talk your ear off since i was a little kid and when i got older she could talk your ear off but she had the neatest stories to tell. And you better believe they were all true. She would tell you about different people's family names. She, you know, one day I asked her about our family. And she's like, oh, do you know that, you know, they go back to Europe. And she would tell me all this stuff of how we're related to, like, these famous kings and queens. And goes back through, like, Germany and England and Scotland or something. I Just all kinds of stuff. But, you know, it's sad I didn't take notes. But my, Roseanne had all that paperwork up in that garage at the lake house in Salina. That was like her second house, or third house. That was her pride and joy. Um, and, and boxes of it. And, you know, I told my daddy, he used to go back and forth to see Roseanne, you know, from California. And, and because he, he claimed he really liked her. I didn't like her. Um, I really didn't. Now, she helped me a lot. She really did. She was a very evil person. It's like people that lived there told me they said she is like like a snake. And I'm like, what are you talking about? They're like, well, she's like the snake that, you know, is hasn't bit you yet. And I'm like, what? She's a very powerful woman. Made of money. Very smart. And didn't have a husband. Okay? And wasn't looking for one. And everybody wanted to be around, near her or with her because she had money and she was super intelligent in business. She literally bought a whole bank in Prior Creek to have her abstracting company in it. Um, and she had several abstracting companies all the way through Oklahoma to Tulsa. And um, uh, she had the title company was up in, in Tulsa. I'd been to that office. I wasn't at the Wagoner office or... Any of those other ones except for prior. I, I did work in the prior office, but they were all mean to me because my aunt was the owner. Oh, they treated me like trash. And I was just trying to learn the business. Roseanne Bennett wanted me to work. And I said, sounds great. I mean, this woman's paying my way. I'm living free in her apartment building, supposedly managing it in exchange 
um, and she was paying my daycare, and, um, uh, you know, I was trying to transfer my hair license from California, um, and, uh, uh, that was a terrible thing, and, um, <laughs> And so in the meantime, you know, I worked, I thought, well, you know, it's a good way to like pay her back because she's forking out all kinds of money. I mean, she bought food for the house, filled it all up, would take me to Sam's in Tulsa and give me cases of crap and bought my daughter clothes. And I mean, we really didn't have to bring anything, but I shipped stuff for four weeks to Oklahoma through the United States Post Office. Anything I could fit in boxes that were legal to ship, I shipped everything I could. And left a lot behind, unfortunately. But she took care of the rest. I mean, from furniture to food, the utilities, put a phone in. God, I was abusive with the phone. Man, I had huge phone bills calling on my friends back home because I hated Oklahoma. Oh, God, I hated it. I, it just wasn't my thing. I liked the beach. I liked the good weather. I did not do snow. I did not do ice. I did not like, oh, was tornadoes? Oh, I didn't know that Wizard of Oz was a true thing, okay? <laughs> I had no clue. None. So, anyway, there was a big spider right here, and it looks like a fiddleback. Ick. But, um, first time I've seen a spider there. But, anyway, so, um, the whole family was kind of interesting. My cousin, John Cash, Jr., there was a character. His mother was Roseanne. And um, it was kind of hard to believe. Now, she thought he was really entertaining. But she didn't like him. She used to say stuff like, I will never leave him anything when I die. Well, she really didn't have to. He had money. He was in the title business, too. Okay? So he, I, you know, it wasn't like he needed her stuff. That's for sure. Was waiting for it. And and he he just he was different. Um, I remember when I went back, you know that 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 he I knew him a little bit when I was a kid since I was like eleven. Um, he was he was kind of a character. Um, I, when I was living there, we were sitting on the patio, and he had brought what my aunt Roseanne calls his bedroom so he had this big like RV that he would bring with his wife Jean she was really nice very smart lady they didn't have any kids or anything um uh didn't want any and um uh Roseanne would say he's bringing his rolling bedroom because he would never stay in the house at the lake he, he would never do that he would bring that RV and he'd stay in that thing in the driveway I'd microwave the whole thing so we were sitting on the back deck overlooking the lake. I guess it was Lake Hudson. <clears throat> and he's like, hey, so like you party? And I'm like, well, I used to. Uh, before I had kids, he goes, look, I got some Coke. And I'm like, I'll take a Coke right now. And he's like, no, I got Coke. And I was like, nah. and he's a little bit older than me. So, uh, uh you know, I was like, you know, aren't you afraid to be doing, like, go fast? And he's like, no. You sure you don't want any? He said, I'm going out there to my my, my RV out there and, and do a couple lines. But if you want some, come. And so years later, you know, my dad had flown back to Oklahoma for Roseanne. Because apparently my cousin John Cash had died. <coughs> and he said, well, you know, your John, your cousin John Cash died. And I said, really? And uh, I said, what do you do? Die from the coke? And he goes, how did you know? <laughs> I said, well, because I knew. Uh, and he, the sad part was he went broke. I think him and Jane divorced. Lost everything. Last I heard, he was like in a... In, in a camper trailer in the woods, and he was supposedly writing, like, letters for the newspaper or something. So he, was, he decided to be a writer. And here's a guy that bought a whole bank in Tulsa that was also full of marble, like that place that Roseanne bought down in Pryor, and had a big title search company. 
And I mean, he was living. He had a plane. Um, God, he had a great house. Uh, outrageous house when he was with Gene. Um, uh, but, you know, I guess the drugs kind of took it all away. I don't know. But Roseanne was so bad about me giving my daughter Tylenol. You know, when she hit fever and stuff, I'd give her Tylenol. And Roseanne was like, it was like, stop giving her that stuff. It's like giving her drugs. She's going to become an addict. And here I'm going, the freaking addict is your kid. You know, this is what I'm thinking in my head. Couldn't tell her that, but Roseanne was evil. She was evil. But my daughter never became a damn addict over Tylenol. Trust me. Even to this day, I don't believe my daughter was ever an addict or a drunk. Um, and um, I don't think Tylenol would have brought that on. So, you know, yeah. But yeah, the family's interesting. Very, very interesting. Um, and this guy that's on the blog here, he is a relative from my daddy's side of the family, from Tessie's, his mother Tessie's side of the family. And I, he's, I think he said his mom is Dora or something like that. Um, I didn't know there was all those relatives. I never knew anything about all that. I, I All I knew was Pearl McCullough, and she was... Mm, never saw her face, but she pissed me off. <laughs> I, can't, I can't tell you how many times I'd grab that telephone out of Tessie's hand and go, You know what? You stop getting her upset, you're going to kill her. If you guys can't get along, don't call here. It's my phone. I own it. <laughs> you know, and I would hang up on her. And, but those two, it was just a thing. They would like to argue all the time. But, but uh, uh, Tessie was really quite an incredible person. Um, and I, I respect that. You know, um, uh, you know she, she was pretty iconic. Um, just like my daddy, just like my mommy, um, pretty iconic people, just like my grandfather on my, uh, my mother's daddy, but that family is really interesting. I remember asking my, my cousin John, I said, look, I said, uh, you know, does anybody ever mistake you for Johnny Cash? And he's like, you should see when I make hotel reservations. He said, man, it's like they roll out the red carpet when I get there. Now, my, my cousin, John Cash Jr., he, he, um, he is like, really, it's really weird because Roseanne was a little person. Um, he was a really nice looking guy, okay? He was like the 70s kind of dude. He was like, you know, over six foot tall, uh, you know, lumberjack looking kind of guy. Wore a suit well. Uh, real clean cut, you know, Superman hair, dark hair, combed back, like, probably, like, black hair, combed back, you know, the English style cut beard, and, and all that, I mean, really nice looking, really, really nice looking, like, if you weren't my cousin, I'd probably dated a guy like that, um, but he was kind of goofy, <laughs> he was kind of a goofy cat, but he was funny. He was funny, and I, I, I imagine that there was nobody that was not a friend of his. Um, he was one of those kind of people that everybody loved, I'm sure, uh, except for his own mother. Um, she just really, you know, I don't know, she had this hatred for that guy. Um, you know, and he always beckoned to her call. It was a big thing when Cousin John would come out, you know, from Tulsa or wherever. Um, he had a house just outside of Tulsa, a big, huge house. This one year, it was really funny. You know, he liked to go out in the woods and get his own tree for Christmas. Um, which I guess is a great conversation for right now since we just had Christmas. And now he had no kids. It was just him and Jean. And they had this glorious house with huge vaulted ceilings. Kind of out in the country there. And um, so he decides to go out and, you know, get a tree. And he goes out there, gets this humongous, beautiful tree. Drags it into the house, and and I think Roseanne was there or something, and, and his mom, and and she she was like you know laughing her head off because when he brought the tree in the house and tried to put the tree up, it was about two or three foot short of you know ceiling. It was too tall, so they had to lay the tree down and saw the top off. 
to get it to fit in the house. <laughs> this looked really funny. And Roseanne was like, yeah, this tree looked like it was like growing out of the ceiling. Um, and she thought it was pretty humorous in, in, um, uh, you know, in her weird, odd way. Roseanne was mm, strictly business, very intelligent woman, very wealthy woman. And I mean, penny pincher, one way pockets, like pockets that went reverse. She would take the garden hose at the lake house and lay it out on the patio. And you know, in Oklahoma it gets really hot. And, and she would lay it on the patio and, and she would come out there for the weekend. She'd leave Tulsa to go to her house because it was her piece. And she would take that big garden hose, lay it out on the deck. And then she would go take the garden hose and drag it into the house and put it in the kitchen sink and let it drain into the kitchen sink, which was hot water. And then she would do the dishes with that. She never bought a sponge. She always used a rag, which I told her was not even safe. Because it has germs. You know, you're not supposed to use old dish rag. You're supposed to use sponges. And when they get funky, you throw them away. You don't wash a sponge. You throw it in the trash. But she was not in for that. If She was a penny pincher. With utilities, everything. But yet, she always had to have... Um, her, her favorite cut of meat was that... Uh, uh, I forget what you call them. They're the little tiny steaks. And the people think they're really neat. And the, to me, they're bull crap. They're just a little tiny steak that's like two inches thick. She'd have a bunch of those frozen in the freezer. And that was what she made. And she used to make this cornbread stuff. I'm, I'm not Southern. Um, and not all Southern food appeals to me. But this cornbread, my cousin John, he used to say since I was a kid, he was like, he was like, um, uh, the food's not going to be any good unless mom burns the, the biscuits or the cornbread. And I was like, what? And he would laugh. But it was true. There was a couple times where she did not burn the stuff. I mean, she could be standing over it and it still burned. And um, she would she would make cornbread in like this cast iron skillet that looked like little corns. And she would make it and then put it in the oven. She could be standing over it and that damn stuff would burn. I swear. It was like, don't burn it. Don't burn it. Well, she says, well, I'm not going to. I'm not going to. And it, it would like burn like every time. But a few times that it didn't. And guess what? The food was kind of lousy. And she, she would cook this very exotic type food. Um, it was, um, she, she spent all her spare time reading cookbooks and Southern living and all those you know, really expensive cookbooks. They used to mail the magazines to the house. and So she would spend the whole weekend drinking a glass of wine and reading these cookbooks for all these recipes. But she was outrageous cook. I mean, really. And she wasn't a atypically Southern cook at, at all, I don't think. Maybe when I was younger and I used to come out and visit from California when I was like 11 to 12. But um, when I moved out there, she didn't cook typically Southern food. Um, it was really funny because, you know, she was like, you know, you can make cornbread. And I said, oh man, you know, in California, it's that there's a, a place called, um, uh, what is it called? I'll think of the name of the restaurant in a minute. And they used to sit Marie calendars. They, they, the dessert was this cornbread cake. that was like four inches tall. And then they would pour like butter over it, hot butter melted. And then put whipped cream on it. And it was just the most tastiest thing you ever had. And so that was my idea of cornbread. And so it's actually not really like that. It's, it's at all. <laughs> um, it's like this, this stuff. It's like this grainy stuff. And Roseanne would say, you know, you can make this. Because my baby loved that stuff. And, and I'm like, okay. And she's like, you just go buy this Argo cornbread mix and make it. So I went, I got some, trying to be truly Southern, you know, in, in, from my house and went home and wanted to make this cornbread and um, uh, I was so excited to give it to my baby and I handed it to her and she was in her high chair thing and, and, and she was like all excited and then when she put it in her mouth, she run it out with her tongue like sand and I'm like, oh no, I went to taste it. Oh my God, it was like the sandbox. Uh, no, and I told Rosanna, I said, that stuff doesn't even work. I said, I did everything it said on the instructions. And, 
And it's like the same box. She's like, how can you screw up cornbread in a box? And I mean, she made it from scratch. And I said, well, because I'm not Southern, I guess. But um, the South is interesting. Very interesting. Um, I think I did uh, like a year, maybe, in Oklahoma. And I left. Oh, I hated it. It, it might have been two years, but I think in a year. Um, I did military college there at Claremore. Um, really enjoyed that. Had some great instructors. Long drive. Um, did a few tornadoes through there. Boy, that was really scary. Um, and, and let me tell you, when it rains and the lightning, that's serious stuff. It's nothing like the rain in California. These are a bunch of pusses back home. Got, you know, we went recently, my little girl and I went recently, got going to California, and <coughs> they were like, oh, it's raining, and I'm like, this isn't rain. I said, you ought to move to the south, man, it's like a shower. Literally. That's not rain. The weather's real extreme, you know, when you get south or like back east, you know, things like that. It's really different. Uh, and it's sure not that 70 degree everyday kind of California weather for sure. But you meet a lot of interesting people. You learn a lot of things. It's like flopping back in time. Um, I'll never forget that first time I pulled up in a gas station in Pryor Creek, Oklahoma, Mays County. And it was this little bitty gas station with like two pumps. And a gentleman was standing out there with the jumpsuit on. And, and it, it was... It was, uh, he's standing there by the pump, and I'm getting ready to get out and pump the gas. And, um, and, uh, he said, oh, no, ma'am, I'll get that for you. And so that was the first thing that pissed me off, because some dude called me ma'am. It's like, I'm not ma'am, my mother is, okay? Like, to me, that's like, you're calling me old. You know, I hate that. I know it's a southern proper thing. I still hate it. I still hate it. Um, I don't like it. Um, but, um. So, anyway, you know, I said, you know, just, uh, you know, uh, fill it up, which was probably about 20 in that big Lincoln. So, anyway, he goes and he puts the, the uh, he's putting the fuel in, it's on the clicker thing. And, and what's really weird is the gas pump is going ding, ding. I'm like, what the hell? It was like a step back in time. It was like Twilight Zone. I hadn't heard a gas pump ding since I was a little tiny kid. Okay? And it, in California, they had gas pumps with three hoses on them. You had to pick up all this crap just to try to put gas in the car. I mean, you know, they didn't have, you know, full service. And, you know, they had four gas stations on every corner. And, and, but Oklahoma was really different. And, and Pryor Creek was a little, what you call a podunk town back then. It was freaking Dust Bowl with about five businesses total in that whole place. Oh, my God. Oh, what did I go to? So, um, anyway, so this, this guy, you know, he's got the gas running by itself. The pump's dinging. And I'm sitting there going, man, is this like a bad version of Twilight Zone or Outer Limits, you know? Um, it was kind of weird. And, and, you know, you start visualizing, well, these people are ultimately poor because they can't even afford the new gas pumps with, like, three hoses and all that. So, anyway, he hits the deck in front of my car. I'm like, oh, my God, this guy's had a damn heart attack in front of my car. And I'm, 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 I, like, jump out the door. You know, my baby's in the car seat. And I'm like, sir. And he's, like, down on the ground. I said, what are you doing? Are you Okay. I said, yes, ma'am, just checking the air in your tires. And I'm like, what? Now, you know, full service was went out years ago when I was a little bitty kid. You know, they had full service gas stations when I was a little bitty kid. That was like way out of style. They didn't pay people to go do full service anymore. And you were lucky if you could find any full service or regular self-serve. But this was a full-service gas station. This guy was checking my tires, did my windshield, you know, checked my fluids, all that stuff. It was so weird. And and I turned around, I gave him a $20 tip. <laughs> I did. Here you go, sir. Thank you. Um, and he just thought, you know, like that was like a $100 bill to him. Um, the post office. The post office 
Pryor Creek, Oklahoma. I go to this little tiny building that's supposed to be the post office. And God in California, you know, the post office is open like 24 hours a day, seven days a week. It's, you know, uh, self-service, full service, whatever you want it to be. And they're really big. And, you know, and I go to this little tiny building, like if you blink, you'll pass it. And I think it was on, on Graham Street, if I remember correctly. There was Sandusky's. Uh, that was an interesting store, too. Sandusky store. Feed store. And then um, there was the post office that was on the left side, on the same side of the street as Sandusky, and on the same side of the street as my, my Aunt Roseanne's um, abstract company. And so uh, I went in the post office in one day to, uh, what did I, I had to mail something or something or pick up some boxes that, were, you know, all my stuff was still being shipped from California for weeks. It was still coming. Shipped it for four weeks before I left, and it was still coming. Boxes and boxes. So I would drive down there to save them the trouble of bringing all these boxes because they were all being shipped to the abstract office. And my aunt was in to get kind of peeled because miles of stuff was coming in all the time. So um, I went down there and oh, it smelled like the sewer. Ugh. And there was nobody at the desk. You know, like you ring a bell and you're standing there waiting and waiting and waiting. And then all of a sudden, you know, this woman comes out with this typically southern prior accent i can help you and i'm like i'm yes miss uh um you know da, 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 da. and then i was like what is that smell you know it, to me it was like the sewer is broken or something you know what is that smell and she says oh hi you know we are cooking beans in the back for our lunch i'm like oh my god they're cooking in the post office really i mean it's just so different in the south so different and it's like you know a lot of that stuff's kind of funny when you look back at it it was shocking then it was kind of weird but you know it was their way things were different it's like the way that people drove out there they used to call me two wheels why because i drove with two wheels in the dirt all the time because all these jamokes are driving down the middle of the road with their arm around their chick in a big truck and one of the girls I worked with at Roseanne's Abstract Office, uh, uh, Jonna, I think it was Jonna Troyer. She was a character. Now, here's a girl with a boy's name. That was weird, too. There's a lot of girls with boys' names in Oklahoma. And and her name was Jonna. And I felt so weird calling her that because she didn't look like a dude. And and um, she was really sweet. And, and I just thought, how criminal they named her Jonna. And so... You know, she got to be a pretty good little friend of mine. She was neat. She was the only one treating me nice in that whole office restaurant treating me like trash because they hated me because I was a relative that came into work and they took that as a total threat. And I don't think I want to be abstract in the rest of my life. Uh, no. But I was just there to learn something new. That was cool. I was trying to, you know, pay back Roseanne by working there. You know, because she spent a lot of money on me and my little baby. But she ended up giving me a paycheck anyway. Um, kind of thing. It was kind of interesting. And I thought I was trying to do the right thing. But people treated me like total trash. And would get me in trouble all the time. Telling me the wrong stuff. On purpose. But John was pretty cool. And I told John one day, I said, it's very interesting here. She says, boy, I bet. And I said, I said yeah, it's real different from California. I said... You know, why do the people drive like they do here? These people cannot drive. You know, I thought downtown LA was wicked. But, man, this place, I mean, they can't drive. And she's like, what do you mean? And I said, well, you know, I'm going down the road and some dude will be driving a big old truck with mud all over it. And it has his arm around his chick and he's driving down the whole middle of the road. There's two sides of the road, okay? Why on earth... You know, it's like they're scaring me. They're trying to run me off the road. I got my baby in the car. I'm like, it's freaking me out. And there's like no speed signs because most everything's dirt roads. There were asphalt roads in Prior Creek a little bit. But after that, it's all dirt. And especially all the way to the lake in Salina. And um, she said, well, you know, most people, 
They, 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 they learned how to drive on a tractor. I'm like, oh, quit it. I thought she was joking with me. She's like, nope, nope, serious. She says, most people, you know, they, they learn how to drive on a tractor first. And I'm like, oh, my God. Oklahoma was definitely a pure shock. I will say they do make terrific um, um, chicken and dumplings. Oh, my gosh. Oh, my gosh. They have, there was a restaurant out on the main highway, and, and I told Rosanna one day, I said, you know, I really would like chicken and dumplings. She goes, God, they're so easy to make, and it costs pennies. I said, well, you make it? She's like, no. And and so, you know, she had told me about this old mom and pop type joint down on the highway. And so I went there one day with my baby, and I, I ordered chicken and dumplings. And I'm like, do you guys, like, cook it here? And they're like, oh, yeah, everything's made from scratch. So... I ordered it and it was all, all of what three fifty or something. They brought me the most horrendous plate of chicken and dumplings, and um, it was so good. Oh my gosh! In love, love that stuff. Um, there's certain southern foods that I like, um, but there's others that I don't. I am not a southern type person. I don't like fried food. I really hate it. Um. And there's some trick southern foods, uh, lots of trick southern foods. But it was definitely an experience being in Oklahoma. I, and I kind of understood a lot more of what my mother had married because these so-called Okies are really different. <laughs> They're really different kind of people. It's a different, entirely different lifestyle. It's so different from California. You know, in California, I, I've worked with a girl that had southern accent and it was kind of neat. It was, like, really entertaining to listen to her talk. It was like, wow, you know, is this girl faking it or real? That they really talk like that. And um, um, and then translations. This was the next part about Oklahoma. My good friends, supposedly good friends, um, uh, Michael and Linda Brown, boy, they got me for a ton of money out there. Uh, many thousands. And um, uh, Linda would tell it, be talking and she would say and so you know they were going down the holler and da 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 and they carry you over to the store and I'm like so why were they yelling and she's like the holler the holler I'm like what are you talking about I mean they're so they're yelling no 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 the holler is this place in the road you know it's like goes down I'm like it goes down they're like yeah you know when you go out to your aunt Roseanne's house out there at the lake you know, the road goes kind of up and down, you know, like roller coaster. That, the low part, you know, the hauler, the hauler. And I'm like, okay, so the low part in the road is called a hauler. But if I yell, I'm hollering at you. I don't get it. Um, And carry you. And carry you. You know, I carried them all the way to the store. And it's like, Jesus, your car was broke. No, no, no. I carried them to the store. I'm like, what the hell is carried to the store? I mean, you got to be strong to pick them up and carry them all that way. No, 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 no. I carried them to the store in my car. And I'm like, okay, I'm still lost. I, it was just very different. Don't ever ask for directions in the South. Oh, my God. I had to go out to Lake House, and Roseanne drew me this little map on a piece of paper with no street names. And it's just, it looks like, it looks like, like this, okay? To go from Prior Creek to Salina, it was like, okay, here's like, you know, the apartment complexes on the corner. Go around here, and you're going to go here, then you're going to go over here, and you go over here, and you go over here, and here, and here, and you're going to go over here, and like this. And so, so she draws me like this, this map thing, Okay. And it's kind of like this. So, like, this is the apartment building over on, I think it was Van Street or something. It was by the Walmart. That was another good story, too. And then, you know, it was like, you go here, and then you go here, and then you go over here, and then go over the railroad tracks. And then you're going to go out here, and then you're going to go over here. There's no streets. Why? In California, I get a map book. You buy this MacBook downtown LA for 35 bucks. It's got millions of pages. You look up street name. It tells you A1. You go to find A1 and you can find it. Okay. But no, they don't have that. They don't have a road map for Prior Creek, Oklahoma. Because nobody 
took the time to draw one. Um, I don't know. So, when you, you know, I had a terrible time trying to find a lake house. Oh, it was absolutely horrible. You know, we didn't have car phones back in the day and all that. And you were out in the country. I mean, you know, once you left prior, you know, a couple miles after that, it's all like dirt roads. And it's, there's nothing out there. It's like grass, woods, a couple of refineries or something, and and just, it's dark, especially at night, it's pitch black. Oh, my gosh. And there's wild animals and stuff in it. Ugh. And so, it, it's just, like, really bad. I'm like, I'm going to be lost. Like, I'll end up in, like, Ohio or something because I'm going to take a wrong turn. And so, you know, when you get, you think you're kind of lost and you ask somebody, you stop and you ask somebody, because it was real safe back then, you know, you could talk to a stranger and they weren't going to, like, kill you, rape you, steal your car or anything like that. Everybody's pretty friendly. And, and uh, um, you know, you'd say, hey, I'm trying to get to my Aunt Roseanne's house in Salina out, you know, at Lake Hudson. And, and, and they go, hi, so here's what you do. Okay, now you go down this road. You go down this road, you keep following this road. Now it's going gonna, it's gonna to come to a Y. Now you're going to take that Y and you're going to turn left. Now my cousin's house is on the corner. It's yellow. It's yellow, yellow, and it's real pretty anyway. And and but then you keep on going, and then you're gonna go down over here and kind of veer to the right. Now don't turn left, but veer to the right. And then and then you know my brother's out there. He he sells you know sometimes hot dogs out there on his front porch, and and so you know you might you might see him in, in your travels. And then you're gonna go a little more ways, you know. And then there'll be you go down the holler. You get on the holler in. And then when you see them railroad tracks, you got to turn left immediately, okay? And then you're going to see the refinery. You'll see the big sign, and that's the refinery. And then you just keep on going, and the, the road is going to do like this spaghetti thing. You go back and forth and back and forth. And then, you know, you go by a bunch of them horses will be over there. A bunch of them horses will be over there on the right now. So you know you're going the right way, okay? And then you're going to, you know, kind of go straight for a ways. For a ways now, um, there won't be nothing there. There won't be no houses, no nothing. But you might see, you know, my brother John might be out there. He'd be, he'd be cutting in fields, you know. So you might see him on that tractor. But anyway, you just keep on going. And when you get up in there, it'd be just to your right. And then her house will be on, on the left, right over the lake. And I'm like, well, I can get kind of close. I can find it. I just need to, like, get there. And so by the time you get all that, you get back in the car, and, like, after you've gone the first two miles, you're like, damn, I'm lost. It is so crazy if you ask for directions in the South. Because <laughs> they're going to take you for a run for your money. And 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 my Aunt Roseanne, you know, the family is really well known there. Um, And, you know, if I mention the name Roseanne Cash, it's like everybody... Like, this pure electric, like, you know, you have clout. It's like having a gold MasterCard. Trust me, I wasn't proud of that because she was a mean, evil person. But probably for a lot of reason. Um, she was with my uncle Ernest years ago um, when I was a kid. Um, Ernest, Ernest Brown, Ernest, I think it's Ernest T. Brown. He was one of the biggest lawyers in Oklahoma. I love my uncle Ernest. Oh, I loved him. He died of pee, -pee cancer, unfortunately. Um, and it was, uh, several years after I moved from Oklahoma, he had passed away, unfortunately. I knew he was sick because he came to see me at my salon before he, he got really sick. And I just adored him. They were so neat together, him and Roseanne. I think that's the last time I ever saw her laugh, the last time I ever saw her decorate her house for Christmas, any of that. She just, they were a great pair. <clears throat> and he was kind of a corny Southern kind of dude. With the bow tie and the hat, you know, the fedora. Uh, he was a character. But, yeah, they're, they're definitely, Oklahoma's definitely interesting. I did learn so much. And then I learned to appreciate a lot. Um, and it's just different. That it, um, It's just a different kind of life, a different kind of people, the southern people. Now, I'm not going to say they're all dirt poor out there. There sure wasn't a lot out there back then. I drove back by there, you know, not long ago, and um, actually my daughter and I did on our way to 
California. And I want to tell you what, we totally passed Prior Creek. And I couldn't imagine how we passed Prior Creek because you couldn't miss it because it was so desolate. There's just not a whole lot there um, on Van and Graham and all that. Um, but it had built up since I had left. Oddly enough, it's like actually a city. Um, like it has real things there. Um, it only had one little, like, what you call a grocery store, but it was really a feed store. God, you came in the front door and you went to pass out because all you were breathing was, you know, like all this gross stuff was, you know, from manure to, to cow feed and chicken feed and all this stuff. And right at the front door, when you rolled in there with your car, it's like, ah, to get past that to go shopping. Um, you know, the girl I worked with at the abstract office, Jonna, I said, so what do you guys do for excitement here? You know, my day of excitement was, you know, the park at the top bar at the top of the Hilton Hotel, you know, by LAX Airport in California. I mean, that was my thing. You know, going to the beach, go to Disneyland. She's like, I'll go to Sonic. I said, oh, cool. And I'm like, so what's the Sonic Club like? And she goes, well, it's a Sonic. It's the only thing in town, and that's where everybody go. I go to Sonic on Friday night. I'm like, okay. I didn't even know what a Sonic was. You know, I thought it was some bar. So in my travels, guess what? I passed the Sonic. It was actually across the street from that so-called grocery store that I call feed store. Um, it was on the left. And it was across from that little tiny gas station. It was full service. And you know what it is? It's a drive-in. It's a drive-in where you eat hamburgers and hot dogs and shakes. Okay? And it's like, you've got to be joking. Surely this girl, she must be pulling my leg because they all like to jack with me because I was different. And I was not from the South. So I thought she was jacking with me. So the next day at work, I said, Jonah, I said, look. I said, I saw a place called Sonic, but I think it's the wrong place. I said, it's a hamburger joint, you know, like a drive-in, like you park your car in there. Like the old-timey car hops would come to your car or something, you know, like in the 50s or something. She's like, yeah, that's it. That's where everybody go. That's the happening place. I'm like, come on. You guys, like, the biggest day of excitement is to go to the, like, the burger joint. <laughs> yep. Yeah. I said, and then what? I mean, is there anything else? Is I mean, Tulsa. I said, okay, so what's in Tulsa? Oh, that's Big Sadie. I said, okay, so how far is Tulsa? Well, it's about an hour. Hour drive. I went, oh. Yeah. So it was definitely a different lifestyle altogether. Very simple, very plain. There wasn't a lot there. There was no skyscrapers there. You know, most all the buildings and houses were like one story, and they built them like that for a reason, because of tornadoes. Uh, yeah. The South is definitely interesting. Very, very interesting. But, um, it, my daddy's family was definitely a large name across the board in Oklahoma. I don't know about Missouri so much, but, and I've been to Missouri. But, um, in my travels many times, but, um, Oklahoma was definitely intriguing. Definitely, definitely. I mean, everybody knows everybody. Everybody knows. I mean, you open a bank account at the bank, they know, you know, who your relatives are, where you come from. Um, you know, there's no real fancy cars. It's not like you're going to see a Rolls Royce or anything driving down the boulevard over there. It was very simple. Most girls drove trucks, which I thought was really strange. Uh, I just can't imagine why a girl would drive a truck unless she was like a dyke. It's the thing. In the South, there's so many girls that just love a truck. They wouldn't take a Corvette, a Cadillac, nothing. They would much rather have a truck. I found that really odd, but that's just a thing. That's just a thing. And it doesn't mean they're a dyke or anything else. That's just a thing. It's a southern thing. So, um, I will say that my big Lincoln was nothing compared to my Camaro in the ice and the snow. That's for sure. Um, my Camaro was a lifesaver. Um, and uh, that was 
yeah, I was like the only one in town that had that flaming red 77 Camaro that I bought used. Um, yeah. Oh, boy, did I go down in history over there. But anyway, but yeah, so it was definitely intriguing. The family's very intriguing. I was so glad to have the honor of getting to know my great, great, great Uncle Rupus. Tremendous man. Um, I just felt it was so unfortunate they put him in nursing home because to me, it just it didn't seem like he needed to be there in any way. Um, but, you know, I don't know. Maybe there was some scam that my Aunt Roseanne got up into. Who knows? Um, uh, you know, Tessie James, iconic individual. Um, I guess I did my time doing the kind good deed by keeping her from going to the nursing home as last resort because my dad wanted to put her away and I absolutely refused because that's what killed my grandfather. And, um, uh, you know, I did, did my good deed for the day. I'm trying to save her from that fate but i've learned so much it's it's so intriguing you know people's backgrounds and what they grew up with and you know what they do the genealogy is very very interesting you know today they have dna tests you pay a 100 bucks they mail you a thing and do it mail it back and supposedly all that stuff's like automatically figured out on a computer or something i don't know if they base it on census trust me you know, there's going to be a lot of people lying on the census because they're hiding. <laughs> I don't like census. It bugs the hell out of me. It's like, I don't, I don't want to say nothing. You know, I don't like it. But it's, it was very valuable since way back because my grandmother, that's what she used as her reference points to do her genealogy work, really and truly. Before there were computers, when it was handwritten letters back and forth and you were waiting for that letter to come in the mailbox, with all that great info and all that stuff. And that's how she pieced everything together. It's unfortunate that those files that were at my Aunt Roseanne's house, which hopefully they're still there. I don't know. She's passed away. Um, she she uh, passed away like, uh, gee, I don't know, eight or ten years ago probably. Um, and some gay guy, I think the guy that worked for her that was gay, I think inherited it all. It was really strange. My father was supposed to inherit it. And then all of a sudden, there was a last-minute thing happened after she died. And my dad was pretty perturbed about it. Um, because uh, it seemed like it was kind of rigged. Um, I don't know. You know, she wasn't married anymore. She had no boyfriends. She didn't do boyfriends. And I kind of thought she was gay. Um, but, you know, that was her business. I just know she was a bridal snake. She really, truly was. She was tough. Um, I appreciate her help way back then. I mean, that was very wonderful, everything she did for me um, and my daughter. Uh, and at one point, she wanted to leave everything to my daughter because she hated her own son so much. And when she died, it probably had a lot of stuff to my daughter on there. I don't know. Um, but, uh, uh, yeah. So she absolutely adored my baby. You know. But anyway, so... Um, We'll do another vlog soon um, about the interesting family tree and some more funny stories. And I hope everybody enjoyed it. Um, to those of you that don't know, there's a gentleman that contacted me today that is apparently related to my daddy's side of the family um, from his mother's family. And uh, it's kind of intriguing, you know. Uh, so it'll be intriguing to hear what he has to say, um, about stuff because he taught me some stuff today that I didn't even know. I, I didn't know my grandmother had all those, you know, like brothers and sisters. I never knew that. All I knew is her and Pearl McCullough. Oh boy. Yeah. And that's another long story. <laughs> but anyway, if you're still on here, my friend. Um, if you have any questions or or anything that you want me to talk about um, uh, about any of the family members that maybe I know or don't know, um, let's do it. Uh, comment below. And um, uh, also, I'm just kind of wondering uh, if you are uh, a resident of Oklahoma by chance because... 
you know, my daddy's side of the family is all Southern. And I'm just kind of wondering if you actually, you know, reside in Oklahoma. Um, and if you knew my aunt Roseanne Cash. Uh, um, but other than that, um, I hope everybody has a really great day. I love you. Thanks for coming to buy the visit. And it's been a slice of heaven, but there's some rollback in time, some funny things I went through. Um, and don't get me wrong, I'm not saying that all Southern folks are hillbillies and stupid. Um, it's just they're different. I, and I, and it, different whether they have education or not, formal education or whatever they do from being a farmer or if they're a stockbroker or whatever it is they do. The South is just a little bit different. And, um, you know, if you're a guest, you need to accept the ways and, you know, spend less time talking and more time listening so that you can kind of understand the ways and not offend anyone um, and learn. Because I really believe the whole world is like that. From state to state, around the world, in different countries and all that. Learn. See what they're doing. Listen to what they say. Learn. Because everybody's a little different. And you know, the variety is the spice of life. If we were all the same, and we all had the same thoughts and theories, we'd sure be pretty boring to talk to ourselves. Because that's what we would be dealing with. That's the, the whole spice of life. Is If everybody's just a little bit different. You learn by listening to others. And their opinions. And what they've been through. And all that kind of stuff. So um, always be open to learning. And always have respect for the elders. They're the ones that are super smart. They're the ones that have the coolest stories, and they're the ones you'll truly learn from in your lifetime. The older, the better to talk to. They're incredible. Incredible. Um, you will learn so much, and it's all for free. Okay? So anyway, I hope you enjoyed it, and, and please do something kind for a stranger. Love everybody. Too much of a good thing is wonderful, and we'll take so much of that. But be kind to somebody, and I'll catch you on the next one. I love you. Thanks for dropping by. Everybody have a great one and a blessed one.